This is the Lepac Area Public Library's Lunch and Learn. And without any further delay, I'm going to give you Barbara Fay Weezy, who's here from the Wisconsin Histor or Wapaka Historical Society. Well, thank you very much, Peg, and I, I really am happy to be here. And, and bon appetit to all of you. You have a really nice lunch there today. Um, and uh, I, I was billed, I noticed, on the website as a historian. And I have to tell you, that's not exactly what I am. I do love history. I am more of a museum person. I'm more of the looking at the objects type of person. But uh, we do have some wonderful historians here in town. And for this program, the uh, Strong Women of Wapaka, I would especially like to thank J.J. Johnson and Julie Hintz and uh, Tracy uh, Barrent. Now, uh, Julie has just retired as the director over at the Historical Society, and we're just so happy to be able to say that we are um, ably continuing with our new uh, director, who is Tracy Barrent, and maybe some of you know her from, this, from the uh, library here. So thanks very much to them uh, for helping me with the research on this. And I will say, if there's anything factually wrong, it's probably me, because sometimes I like to make up stories because they sound good, and it sounds logical to me. So. Uh, most of this, of what I'm going to be doing today, is reading to you from letters that um, the women sent. Thank goodness for the, for, for the women who sent us these letters. So, and as I was, I was thinking about the strong women of Wapaka, my first thought was for the settlers, because those ladies had a heck of a time. And you're going to hear about some of that now. So uh, every community, I think, owes a debt of gratitude to uh, strong women settlers, and Wapaka certainly is in that number. Um, you know, the reason I have this particular slide up is sometimes these, these women, especially from the settlers in the early times, we didn't really have photography till um, after the Civil War, and these ladies sort of seem to fade into the, into the background. Um, there, we, we do have artifacts, we might have a lovely dress, we might have a lovely little pin, but somehow those ladies still seem to be kind of faded into the background, if not slightly out of focus, because there's just something seems to be missing. And what it is that seems to be missing, I think, is the, um, is the stories. And we're, we can be very grateful that these ladies come into full focus when we can read uh, letters that they've written, um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, even Doris Kearns Goodwin has said that it's getting harder for her to write uh, biographies of people, and it's getting harder in general because in, old, in the times that people were writing letters, you could get a very good picture of them. Now that we have um, email and we have te texting and all things like that, it's a little bit harder to collect stories, so we can be very grateful that these ladies uh, can come into focus by, um, have, through their writings. And many of them came together. This is another thing I'd like to point out. Um, in several of the families that I'm going to be talking about, sisters came, brother and sister came, cousins came. People would write back and have their family members come. So at least they had each other. And uh, they needed that very much when they were, when they first came. Okay, now, um, so thinking of Wapaka's women settlers, I thought I'd try to answer three questions. How did they get here? Uh, what did they bring with them? And where did they live? Not only in the Wapaka as a locality, but what kind of structures did they live in? So here's a, uh, a plat map. Uh, it is not from 1849, which is where I'm going to start the story here. But um, it shows you a little bit of how people got here physically. And they either came um, up through Lake Winnebago. They would come up to Oshkosh and then go through. This is not on the map. This is all off down here yet. 
they'd come up through Lake Winnebago, Oshkosh, and go to Lake Butamore, Lake Poygan, and take the Wolf River, now we're on the map, take the Wolf River here. This might work, might not. Maybe I'm standing in the way if I do this. Take the Wolf River to Lake Poygan and come up, and right here, if I can find it, right there is Gill's Landing. And Gill's Landing is where the Wolf River, the Wolf River and the Wapaka River meet. And uh, then they would go follow along that curvy Wolf River over to Wyawega. Now, there wasn't a way to get there particularly, um, but then they'd have to go from Wyawega. They would head on. Now we're coming off the map this way. They'd follow along the river and get over to Wapaka eventually. Before they got to Wapaka, there was a little settlement that was really one of the first settlements uh, in the area. You'll notice that little yellow section, and it says A.H. Chandler on it, Junior, in fact. But um, this is uh, where our story starts. And um, we'll hear of an arrival in spring of 1849. Now, I'm going to put this picture on, even though not starting exactly at Lake Michigan. This is a little bit farther out the peninsula than they, they came from. But um, I, I, it's, we're going to start with Captain Augustus Hill Chandler. And he was one of the first to settle in the area where we just saw. Um, that area is out by the airport. And there still are some of the earliest graves um, out in that area. Uh, the, Captain Chandler had uh, came with two sons, John Wilkes, whose wife was Phoebe, and then Samuel Slade, whose wife was Sarah. And he was joined later by uh, Augustus Jr. and his wife, Susan. Now, um, I'm going to be reading letters from Phoebe. And Phoebe is one of the first people who was buried here. Um, and she's buried out, out by the airport there. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be reading letters, I'm going to be reading really exactly what they said. So if I say, oh dear me, <laughs> it's not me saying it, it really is coming from Phoebe. And she was a wonderful letter writer. I would have loved to receive letters from her. And she's excited about the move at this point, and um, she's a little bit nervous too. She says, Susan, do wish you were here, then how much I could tell, all as such as I cannot write or think. Well, I feel real bad. If the folks were all mad with us, then I could go and leave them with a good stomach. But they pretend to feel so to have us go. And so I'm so big a dunce that I believe it. Wish you were here to make some visits with me, shan't make many. Going to Campbell Forster's and so this week. They were here last week. How I dread these farewell visits. Don't take any comfort. Went to Mrs. Warner's Friday. Had a real good time, only we all felt sadly. Mrs. Warner's feels real bad. Now I have so much to do, I cannot do anything as I want to. Mrs. Powell thinks we can't find a place where people will like us as they do here. Not but that we shall be liked wherever we would go. Soft soap. Well, that makes me think. I've been making soap, tried to make it hard, did not get it all good. But some was real nice. Wilkes says we are all cross. Our moving gets along sore as yours did. Thought we should get away the first of this week, certain. But we have not the wheat. Campbell and Post started, each with a load, and left it on the way. That was two weeks ago. Might have gone last week, but Post would not until tomorrow. So now, yesterday we had a real rain. There's no use fretting. Can't go now. Then during the move, she wrote, Oh, dear me, oh, Susan, how little did I think when I commenced this, where and 
and about all about what we would be before I should finish. Tis now July 10th. Last week, Tuesday, we started from Algoma in a small boat. Now that would be closest to what we're seeing on the screen right now. Uh, the first day went up the Fox to Winnicani. We're obliged to stay for want of breeze until morning. Then went on our way. Still, there was not any air to help much, but with sails and oars, we got a little over halfway. And as there was no settlement, we landed and took lodging in a mosquito grove. <laughs> they received us. Lived till morning, but I cannot say with a whole skin. There was but little sleep. Our number was 12. Father and Mr. Dow were staying on the I don't know what and making a shanty. <laughs> Our voyage was rather hard. We were three days on the river. Did not think it being more than one or two. At last, we are here on the Indian Preserve, and I would not say one word about it anyway if I did not pity poor Wilkes. He should do his own telling. He hardly has a chance to guess who he is. Then he has as many as Job's comforters. They well not kill him. But I was going to tell something, how we find things now, as I guess the men are better pleased than they expected. I sort of reckon tis an entire new country. We are 30 miles from anywhere, and yet we never had half the company as we do now. There, and goes and comes. Now, we're going to hear a little bit more from Phoebe in a little while. This was, okay, this is Polly Esther Kennedy. And she became the wife of Samuel F. Ware. And he was one of the early uh, settlers, as you know, in Wapaka. And uh, so she became polyester wear, which is a name you should be able to remember. Uh, I'm sure she didn't get teased about it then as she might have gotten teased about it now. If her name was cotton or wool, she might have gotten teased a little more. But as polyester wear, I think she did all right. So, um, OK, so this uh, information is going to be from uh, Julia Hansen, who is Polly Esther's great-granddaughter, uh, because Polly was Samuel Ware's wife, and it's a story about Samuel Ware as a child and his family. Uh, and I don't have any stories about the arrival of uh, Polly. My great-grandfather, Samuel Ware, Wapaka's first judge, came to Wapaka first. About a year later, the family followed. The family, which emigrated from Corny, Pennsylvania, consisted of three boys and a girl. We arrived at Gill's Landing by boat, and grandfather, the second eldest, at 11 years old, was, was delegated to go to Wapaka on foot and inform his father that the family had arrived. There was no road but merely an old trail, an ox trail, through the woods. He made the journey safely. Whew. And an ox team was sent down to Gill's Landing to bring the family and their few personal uh, effects. Now, I ask you to think a minute about being that mother who is letting her 11-year-old boy sort of go off into the wilderness and say, just follow the tracks, and you'll probably get there. Uh, because there were quite a few animals in the woods, including bear, deer, uh, cougars, whatever. Um, but he made it. And, I, and I, then I was thinking, this next person we're going to hear from was 13 when she came to Wapaka. She was 15 when she got married. So 15-year-old girls were getting married. It was common. 11-year-old uh, boys, maybe it was common to just say, well, you're the one who's going. 
good luck and here's a cookie or whatever she sent with him to eat. So um, now, uh, and because remember, he was going all the way from Gill's Landing over there. He had to get himself to Wyawega, and then he had to get himself all the way over to Wapaka. So uh, that was a bit of a trial. Um, all right, I will, I can't, I don't think I can go back. There's no going back. <laughs> OK. So I'll just tell you now about Martha, um, uh, Amelia Martha Price. And she's the one who was 13 years old when she moved to Wapaka with her widowed mother and about four, four or five other family members. Um, and at age 15, she married P.J. Nordeen. They had three children, two sons, one who died at age 28 or 29, and one who died as an infant. And then they had a daughter, who um, a, a daughter, uh, Clarabel C., who married R. L. Pope, which is another name that is familiar with a lot of people here in Wapaka. And uh, she lived in Wapaka most of her life. Uh, and in 1859, Amelia Martha Price Nordine was baptized in the Wapaka River and thenceforth served as a loyal Methodist. So our little river is, has uh, quite a lot of work that it's done. So Mrs. Nordine's recollections were written in May of 1913, and she died in 1914. So it was a good thing that, that uh, this school that was having a reunion, uh, the class that was having a reunion, asked her to write down some remembrances. remembrances. At the request of your homecoming committee, we'll write a few of the many pleasant recollections of early life in Wapaka. Mr. Nordine came here in 1851, worked the first season for Augustus Chandler for $5 a month, taking his pay in seed corn at $2 a bushel, seed potatoes at $1 a bushel, and the rest in breaking on his father's farm. His share of his summer wages was $1.50 in money. That had to last him through to his, for his board and attended school. At that time, there was a small Indian village in the grove at the head of Main Street. However, they soon became scarce, though many passed through here, stopping for a short time only. I, with my widowed mother's family, reached Wapaka about May 10, 1855, hailing from Cortland County, New York. We came by way of Chicago. From there to Portage County by rail, and there hired a man and team to bring us the rest of the way. The trip taking two and a half days. We stopped at, at a small tavern called the Tremont House. As we were looking for a farm, we neither cared to buy in town or to board at the hotel lawn. There were six of us. At the suggestion of one of the citizens, we built a shanty where the location pleased us most. After the shanty was completed, another trouble arose. We had nothing to put in it. <laughs> OK, we're going to continue with her there. We'll let her figure that out and continue that story later. Um, and finally, I have a, a very short little contribution by uh, Thorwald Nelson, who was a toddler when he arrived in 1860. So he's just telling what his mother uh, always told him. I can recall my parents telling me we arrived at Oshkosh by boat and train. And then we by steamboat to Gill's Landing and to Wapaka by freight wagon. We settled in Wapaka about 10 years after the village was organized. So that was about 1860 that they came. And as long as we're talking about travel and uh, the 1860s, I included this slide. You might wonder how ladies traveled with those big hoop skirts that they had to wear. Well, it wasn't easy. And in fact, it, uh, it, wasn't, it didn't seem entirely proper. What they had to do was take off the hoops and they would be hooked on the back of the stage so that everybody could get in the stage. And you had all your skirts with you, but you didn't have the air that was there. And you had to learn, of course, with the hoop skirts, they had to learn to sit down by flipping the back up. Because if you didn't flip the back up, 
<laughs> you flipped the front up, and you didn't want that to happen. So all the hoop skirts went on the back. OK, now I'll talk about some of the things that they brought. And uh, one of the things I do at the Hutchinson House with the, with the children and adults is I have a, a number of little detail pictures. And um, they have a little like scavenger hunt trying to find them as they run around the house. It, uh, it works two ways. It helps me two ways. They have something in their hand. And I'm always telling them, eye tracks, just leave eye tracks on things. You don't want to touch them. <laughs> so when they can uh, take these pictures, they have something in their hand. They have a, a mission that they're on. And when they find it, they say, oh, I found thus and such. Then we can talk about that particular object. So it makes it easy for the, uh, for, for the docents there to kind of keep control over some of the dear little chill beans. So this, I mean, you've had a time to look at it, and I'm sure you all know what this is. You can just shout out what you think it is. Yes, it is, it is a crazy quilt. You can't see from the picture that I took here, we have a number of, of beautiful quilts. Please do come to the Hutchinson House and see our quilts. Um, you can't tell by this picture, but this is an autograph quilt. Now, Phoebe probably was given an autograph quilt when she left those dear folks who didn't want to see her go and didn't think she could make friends elsewhere. Um, they probably gave her an autograph quilt because this was very common. Um, people wanted to be remembered, and they wanted you to remember them. So um, I had the quilt, and also they might do a pillow such as this. I did bring this from the, the um, Historical Society. Uh, if a baby were born, if, if there was a marriage, a number of different things, you'd have a, um, an autograph quilt or an autograph pillow. So afterwards, you can kind of come up and see some of these things that are here. That, yep, now this one. Does anybody know what this is? OK, I'm going to show you a different picture because this isn't quite this is a, a very close up. And it's about three million times like it's sort of like that pill that used to cost five dollars and now it costs seven thousand. It's it's really a very small thing. And here, this will give you a better idea. Now <clears throat> when I work with the fourth graders who study uh, Wisconsin history in fourth grade, they come to the uh, Hutchinson House and I have sent them a number of these pictures beforehand so that they can try to guess what they are. They have come up with some wonderful uh, <laughs> ideas of what some of these things could be, make sense. And I love it because they're thinking and they're, they're, they're trying to figure out what things are. Some of the things I put my hand in so that they can get an idea of the size. And this, I'm sure you, now the ladies will all know what this is. It's an egg separator, right. This, you can kind of almost, well, maybe you can't really see what's on. I can see much clearer right here what's inside of this. This is a hair keeper. And every lady would have her hair keeper. They also had specific shawls that they would wear at night to, um, that were very frictious, would, would collect all the hair. As they brushed their hair, they'd take the shawl off, get all the hair off the shawl, put it in their little keeper, get all the hair out of the brush, put it in the little keeper, and the shawl helped keep the hair off the floor also because who was cleaning the house? Mother was cleaning everything. So um, she didn't really want to have anything much dirty there. And here is the result of what they could do with some of that hair. We have some lovely hair um, wreaths at the Hutchinson house. This is from one of them. This is all strands of hair and uh, clumps of hair. Uh, in winter, they would have a hair wreath to put on, um, because they didn't have flowers, for a casket. So they really used these, and I think they would just add sometimes to as, as people passed on. Here's an interesting one. I loved, one of the kids from school said they thought this looked like a doorbell. And I thought, that, that could be, that could be a doorbell. Um, someone else thought it was a spoon, but of course there's space there, so the ladies probably know what this is again another egg separator. And um, uh, I'd like to point out that this, at this point, you'll notice this says National Ice and Coal Company. 
one thing that the historical society is interested in collecting um, because they are small and because they tell wonderful stories is items that businesses give away or gave away in the past. As you're going through your junk drawers or through whatever you have, if you happen to find a comb, um, uh, let's see, I had, recently I found from the 50s, this isn't that far back, but keep things from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, turn them in now because we don't want to get to the year 2095 and people are going, gee, I really wish we had those things from 2012 and 2016, you know, where are they? Collect them now and collect uh, these, if there's little matchbooks or anything that um, a store has given out, we really would like to have those things because they tell a wonderful story. And um, this one is doing that right now. <laughs> I put it this way because it looks like an owl. Uh, <laughs> does anybody know what this is? Uh, one of the kids came up, this is the picture they had, what else would he think? He said, it looks like a hook to hang clothes on. Not quite. It is a horseshoe, or a marsh horseshoe. Um, in the spring they had to start plowing even though some of those marshy areas were still wet. So that is a horseshoe. This. Anybody know what this is that they brought with them? I, yes, I have one, I have it right over there. It's for ironing ruffles. And so this, you had to heat this part up. You had to heat this part up and the, the ruffle part for the top. And then you would put the fabric in there and, and it would ruffle, heat the ruffle. Um, I'm so glad I don't have to do that. Okay, here's another little thing. Can you tell what this little box is for collecting it's, it's for collecting insects. This little box is, you open up the door, and I'm telling you a story. It's for cutting off the wick on the candle. Because, again, mother is cleaning, and she doesn't want that dirty smoke all over the place. So if you have to keep the, the candle wick at a certain height, and you don't want the candle wick to fall back into the wax, because then you, it's still going to be dirty. So you try to snip it off, collect it in that box. This is broken off. There would have been a point right there. And if you did have any wick left in the candle, you would uh, kind of click it off there. Another hair curler. This, you could get, this would wave your hair this way. If you use the circular ones, you'd get curls this way. But this just waved it this way. It is a rag rug. And we have rag, uh, the rag rugs that we have at the Hutchinson House were made in 1953. And please come to the Hutchinson House and see how well they have held up. They are still on our floors. They're still lovely. Those ladies knew how to make rugs. And um, you, you can tell from this close of a picture how very evenly and carefully they worked. And we had a slew of volunteers who uh, laid the rugs in 1953 when the house, uh, when the Hutchinson house was open, and they sewed them all together and did a great job. Okay, so now we're coming back to the ladies again um, uh, to see where people lived, because these are some of the things they brought with them. And everything had to come in trunks. Everything had to come in trunks. Uh, we unfortunately do not know who any of these four ladies are, but. Uh, they're among the settlers and the early uh, people who settled with Wapaka, and we're very grateful for them. Okay, now this is, is Abbey Sessions. Um, <clears throat> they were the first, the first woman in Wapaka, Mrs. W. G. Cooper, we don't have her first name, was the first woman to arrive to a home with a shake roof in the late 1840s. Wood, uh, that's a wood shingle roof. And what they did was they used the shingles. Everybody wanted to make as many shingles as they could because they could use this for money. They could go and trade. <clears throat> they could go to Berlin or to, to other towns and trade the, the shake um, shingles for money. So people, um, everybody was making shake shingles. 
And this is Abigail Chandler Sessions. There's a name again that you, that you would probably recognize. And uh, she moved into the log cabin with a bark roof and floor. So she had a, a log cabin with bark roof and floor, which was pretty fancy at the time. And now I'm going to return to uh, Phoebe Chandler writing to Susan, her sister-in-law. Hand got door or windows. Get along first rate. Mother is quite jolly. Thinks you would enjoy it too. And Sarah. We're both, we are both tavern and boarding house. People are coming in fast, mostly Eastern. There was six along Friday. One said he should fetch his wife as soon as he could get two posts put down. In fact, he meant to bring her sooner. He left Sunday and he should be here tonight. They are from Boston. He is. She's from New York. She's only 17. Don't you pity her. He says she can make Johnny cake. But what do I care for that? My trouble is to know what can be done with her here. Our new shanty is only 14 by 16, made of boards and no partitions. Mrs. Dow and Mother Chandler have beds set up on one side. The rest of us has to bundle in well. How we do this is there are curtains before the beds. Then I hung a curtain across the other way so we can make it into four bedrooms. We have not been by ourselves for a few nights since we, but a few nights since we've been here. Fourteen sometimes, and as thick as three in a bed, and we all look the other way. <laughs> she wrote later in 1850, Susan, you can hardly think how glad we all were to see your husband. If you had been along, our joy could not have been told. He came quite unexpected. Only to me, I had, I had not thought, but he would come, because I had been thinking of Jim, him just before he came. I don't blame you for going east, but how I would love to have you come here. I hope Sarah's folks will come this winter. I will tell better than I can write how it is here. There are two tents just by our shanty, one made today since the boys went out cranberrying. Do you remember when, what I told you? to tell the folks back the East, I don't. But you must say what you think best. I can't think of anything as I am so fuddled up. If it's best for, you, for A, who was her husband, probably um, Augustus Jr., if it's best for A to come back before you do, we'll be glad to take care of him. And you must come again as soon as possible. I know you will. How I wish father and mother were going with you. I had not given up, but they would, till a few days since. I know it would be well for Wilkes and Samuel to have father here this winter and next summer on account of building, but then I do hope they would go east with you now. You must not forget to get me some fine white stocking yarn. And again in 1850 she wrote, should anyone think of ever settling here, now is the time. For one would think, by reports and appearances, that this place would be well nigh filled in another spring. Mrs. Dow wants you to meet her friends. She ex expects her sister Harriet to come here next spring. She hopes they will come with you. If so, do not let them hinder you, nor do not hinder them. For the sooner you get here, we think the better. Don't think it's all because we want to see you. To be sure, we do feel most anxious to see you. But, but then there is the reason why you need to come. Samuel has not settled where to set his house. He, claim, his, he claimed 140 over the river line. I hardly know what to, to write. One thing, we ain't winter killed yet. It's not so bad getting things now as last fall. Susan, do you think this is all to you? If so, you are much mistaken. It's mostly to your husband. He was afraid we should not get enough to eat or get blocked in. In that, he is quite mistaken. It is usual business place. It is a usual business place. No blocking up. 
You can hardly think how glad we were to get your letter. Do write as soon as you get this, and don't wait as I have. And then, of course, the Hutchinson House was one place that they had to live, and I do put this in here. Built in 1855, one of the first houses, once they got um, the, uh, the clapboard that they could, could build things with. So please do come and see our very own um, um, house. I'm not going to tell you about it because you have to come. <laughs> and I'll continue with Mrs. Nordine, I, writing, uh, in, writing in 1913 and talking about 1855, just so you remember. Our household goods were still on the road, and little could be bought in the uh, furniture line nearer than Berlin or Oshkosh. We procured a stove and dishes, and with dry goods box, large for a table, and smaller ones for chairs, did very well. Our kind landlord, Mr. Higgins, loaned us two chairs and a bedstead for my mother's and grandmother's use. About that time, Peter Groves of Stevens Point happened along, and hearing that mother wanted to buy a farm, thought she would like it better there than here, and offered to take her up to have a look at some land. She went, but after looking around, did not agree with him, and found herself in Stevens Point with no way to get back. <laughs> a stage line ran from there to Berlin, striking Plover. From Plover she walked, reaching home on a pleasant Sunday afternoon, but in a weekday state of mind. <laughs> Soon after, she purchased a farm two miles east of town. The only building on the place was a double shanty on the bank of the river, a half mile from the road. The cow and oxen lived out in the open. <clears throat> on our trips to and from Wapaka Falls, we were more apt to meet a bear than a person. <clears throat> in those days, our fresh meats consisted of bear steak, venison, pigeons when they flew, and suckers when they ran. When we moved into the shanties, my aged grandmother thought we had surely reached the jumping off place. <laughs> Soon after, mother built a house. After leaving the farm, our home for many years was where S.S. Chandler now lives. That would be Susan's husband. In 1860, my sister and I planted a row of maples now standing there. They were one inch in diameter when we planted them. So we can especially thank them for some of the maples in town. Okay, how they built the community. <clears throat> in 1849, there was no post office and they had to go to Oshkosh. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a little. <clears throat> they had to go to Oshkosh to pick up the mail and a Captain Jack ran a sailboat from Oshkosh up the Wolf River to Gill's Landing until it froze, and he used to carry the letters for five cents each way, and it charged two cents for newspapers. So E.C. Sessions did the duty of postmaster at Wapaka after that. And in February of 1851 was when we applied to the postmaster general to have a post office located here in Wapaka. Uh, he wrote back to Sessions that he would have to have a name. So Sessions said, Wapaka. And uh, the Postmaster General answered and said he had given the office located at the falls that name, but that Tomorrow River, Wyowega, had applied for the same name to be given to that office, and he had written to them to send him another name. And a few days later, we learned that this would be the Wapaka uh, Post Office. And um, the, the name Wyowega had been given to Wyowega. So if the Wyowega man had been a little sooner, they would have had the name of Wapaka, even if they didn't get the county seat. Um, so uh, this is uh, the post office here, and it's at uh, 230, no, 208, I'm sorry, 208 South Main Street. And the reason I bring it up here too, I'm not gonna mention a lot about the history of the library because there's wonderful books about it, and that's a whole program in itself. Um, but the first library was in rented rooms. Actually, they were rent-free. That's the kind of rented room to have. 
a rent-free room up above the post office was where the first library was. And people began to talk about the public library, getting a public library in the 1880s. And um, then in 1900, it was 1900 that the first library was stall installed uh, over the, the post office here. And then, of course, we know that we have a, a wonderful uh, Carnegie Library. OK, so um, now Amelia Nordeen also noted some of these things. In 1855 to 1856 was when uh, <clears throat> uh, Wapak was named the county seat. And there were no licensed saloons, but liquor could be procured at almost any place of business. <laughs> the, I imagine the churches accepted, if you want to consider them a place of business. And there were three church denominations present in, uh, 18, by 1855, 1856, and the, the Baptists, she, uh, this is again from Mrs. Nordine. The Baptists holding services in the schoolhouse, the Presbyterians with Dr. Marsh as pastor in the Gothic Hall, which was about where the courthouse now stands. So this picture is um, of half. I, I, did my, I did my judicial editing here, and I, I'm sorry, I cut most of the men out. But this program <laughs> is about women. So. This is uh, the, the women's contingent, the sopranos and the altos from the, from the Baptist choir, an early uh, picture of the, from the Baptist choir. And the Methodists had a church, and again, this is Mrs. Nordeen. The Methodists had a church up and enclosed. During the summer, services were held in it with seats of plank held up by nail kegs and a workbench for a pulpit. In the fall, a little more work was done on the church. Among other things, a pulpit was built, which was quietly removed by the ladies of the congregation during the still watches of the night. It was replaced later by one that suited them. And, in the, and she says, in the winter of 56, everything was very high. Now, this is Mrs. Norton, who was married at age 15. I remember that eggs were 50 cents a dozen and scarce. At that time, I was looking for some to make my wedding cake. After some time, I located a lady who owned a few chickens and visited her. Upon making my errand known to her, she said, if you want those eggs to make a cake for the Methodist donation meal party, then you can have them. If not, you cannot. <laughs> the cake was made and frosted without eggs. So then, that takes care of the Methodists. We won't have a picture of them here. <laughs> However, we will have a picture now of Mary Ann and Hannah uh, Parrish and their respective husbands. Um, and they were largely responsible for the uh, Episcopal Church coming when it did. Uh, their father was very wealthy. They traveled out. They were cousins of the Hutchinsons. They traveled out. And almost as soon as they got here, uh, Mr. Lord, and, um, and Mr. Brown um, laid eyes on them and decided that the, they would make wonderful wives. So um, uh, they, were, they were married in the Hutchinson house um, in, 18, in 1856. And this is the fine gentleman, Jackson Kimbrough, who was the bishop, the, the, the Episcopal bishop here. Their father wrote to the Episcopal bishop and said, OK, there are these two guys, and I want you to check them out, because I don't want my daughters marrying riffraff. So the bishop checked them out, decided they were fine, and he said, I'll do the weddings. It's, it's all right. So the bishop came to, do their, to, do their, uh, to perform their weddings. And this says, this is to certify that Edward L. Brown and Mary A. Parrish were united by me in holy matrimony on the fourth day of March in the year of our Lord, 1856, at Wapaka in the state of Wisconsin. Signed, Jackson Kemper, Bishop of the Protestant Episcopal Church in Wisconsin. OK, now we're going to go. And there's the uh, St. Mark's Church, one of the first pictures of, or not one of the first pictures, but uh, uh, St. Mark's Church has always been on that same site. <coughs> okay, now we're going to go to the schools. 
And um, they, the, the schools were, um, the first school in Wapaka was the summer of 1851 in the Baxter home on the corner of Oak and Ware Streets. Uh, but in 1855, when uh, Hannah and Mary Parrish came, they wanted, what they intended to do out here and what they did was run a private school for girls. Uh, so that was the first public schools were 1851. They came out and for a short time ran a private school for girls to teach them piano, how to speak French, how to be a proper uh, young lady in the, in the world because Wapaka was going to be a, a going concern. And then, uh, this is Sunnyvale School. This, this shows where the, the um, let's see if I can do this, number six, right here. This is where Sunnyvale School was built. This, that's Wapaka over there. Um, this lists the schools. It might be kind of hard to see what they are. But um, I, I specifically note the Sunnydale School because at the Hutchinson House, we have the Sunnydale, Sunnyvale School bell. And we're happy to have that as a, uh, one little reminder of the fact that uh, even up until the day that I was going to schools, there were, there were wonderful one-room uh, uh, rural schools. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of the, what, the first high school. And um, uh, it was built, the first brick school uh, called the Union High School. And it was built in 1867, probably after the Civil War because all of the men had been gone. Uh, men and boys were gone to the Civil War, so they started, there, there was not a lot of building, and the, the women were trying to keep the farms and everything going. And then there was some, some more uh, building after the Civil War, and, and men got back. And it was the finest school building in the county. Uh, it, it, was, it was called at the time. Here it is you know, early on, and you can see uh, the fence and the, just the grass. This is it in 1869 when some trees had grown up a little bit, and uh, the school uh, had a road in front of it and a lot of improvements made. Now we're going to go up to uh, the winter of 57. And this again is Amelia Martha Price Nordine. She did have a name besides Mrs. PJ. <laughs> the winter of 57 will always be remembered for its deep snow and heavy crust over the snow. Many times I walked from my home on Division Street to my mother's home on Main Street over the tops of the fences. The men, in getting up wood, would have to shovel the trees out of the snow after they were cut down before they could cut them up. Winters were severe, times hard, living high and wages low. None of the Wapaka people, except the few old settlers, now enjoying the privileges of this prosperous little city, can imagine the hardships of those times or the ways and means employed to live and enjoy living. I sometimes think that we did enjoy life more under those conditions than the average person of today. And finally, uh, I'd like to have this picture. I've tried to keep everything pre-1900, but I found this postcard, and it's Main Street in Wapaka, Wisconsin. You'll notice this lovely big building. Uh, it was the women's building, and they had a women's millinery shop in there. They had all kinds of women-run um, businesses. There were a couple of lawyers who were women in there. And how long are you going to let me keep saying these kinds of things <laughs> without questioning any of it? <laughs> they didn't have this building. This is the postcard that, from 1913, but I think it was a joke. So that Wapaka had a sense of humor even back in 1913. <laughs> Maybe someday we will get a building like that. This is how the, the, how the uh, Main Street actually looked. This is 1910, how the Main Street actually looked. And I'd like to end with our dear Polly Esther Ware again. This is a picture of her. Um, it, it noted that everybody called her Aunt Polly. I'm sure she was full of good stories. And she was a letter writer. And she's the kind of woman we need today. And uh, to, to keep, uh, you know, we think of where do you go to, to find about the stories of your life and your family? Well, you go to your grandma. You go to your great aunt. That's, I'm a great auntie. I'm not a grandma. But, you know, you, you go to the older generations. And 
Wapaka Historical Society is Wapaka's grandma. So please bring us your stories. Before people die, ask them questions because you don't want to get to the point where you pick up this picture and you go, um, I think that was daddy's father's brother who came to, you know, we don't know who they are. Please write names on the back of all your pictures and dates if possible. And uh, we love to have stories, so please bring those in. We have a, a tremendous uh, group of women settlers to follow. And um, they look small, but they had some pretty big shoes. So we need to just keep on walking and keep Wapaka going strong. Thank you very much. I do have a number of things here if you'd like to come up and look and see what they are. Um, eye tracks, remember, if, if, if you can keep, keep some eye tracks. I do have a picture <coughs> here, I said the woman who just said eye tracks. Um, this is uh, Betsy Mumbrew, and um, the Mumbrew is another family who was, uh, you know, early settlers. This is a little oil lamp. You can see where the uh, wick would go and it could be hung up this way. I have some of these infamous things and I, you'll have to come up and see this for yourself, but please don't do it. This is an egg beater. The Victorians were wonderful about uh, gadgets that could do one thing. And this is the most economical way to store your egg beater, but this is how it has to be used. So I think it was a brilliant idea. This is a, was handmade. Most of their things, so many of their things were handmade. They weren't purchased. And I think if somebody would make these today, <laughs> that a lot of people would really love those. I mean, I would buy at least 12 because <laughs> I'd give them to all my friends. Then I'd have to buy one, two, three, four, five, eight, eight, yeah, give them all you. So this is a wonderful little thing. This, I would just like to say, looks like a toy. It is not a toy. This would be, um, it could either be hung on the wall like this, it is a tiny little uh, lamp, or it could sit on a safe place. It could be used as like a nightlight. It would hold about five minutes worth of oil, and mother could know that the children would be safe. The house probably would not burn down. So, and then I'm going to just open this up. Um, we saw Marianne and, and Hannah Parrish. This is uh, Marianne's uh, traveling case, and I'm just going to open it up. It would have her uh, pens and things. I'm going to open up the bottom also. There's a little pin here that releases a little hidden drawer. They would carry these with them when they went on their great travels, and a maid would be carrying uh, the box, would have their calling cards in it so they could be, be proper. And um, it had smelling salts, which they would need, and rose water, which they would need. Yeah. and um, a pen and, and all kinds of things. And then they could keep documents, money, or jewelry in that lower hidden drawer. So, and there are a few things that they did not bring with them. Do you mind if I go on for a minute? There are a few things they did not bring with them. Something like this could be made from trees that were plentiful and you were cutting them down anyway. So they made a lot of their implements out of, out of wood and um, didn't have to bring those kinds of things. The trees were nice and big. This is not the biggest bowl that we have at the Hutchinson house, but I thought it was big enough to illustrate that they had some pretty big trees and uh, they could make some wonderful bowls. And it just, you want to touch it, just you can see. This is how they got their, their not their cotton, which is what's in here. But their sugar, their flour, etc., came in bags like this. And uh, I'm going to touch one more thing here. In fact, I'll just put this down here. I love this chair. The Victorians were extremely clever. And they had a lot of things. It, it wasn't that hard to bring this beautiful chair. They had a lot of folding chairs. So this is one of their folding chairs. And I ask you, would you rather have the folding chairs that we have today, or would you rather sit in a lovely little rocker 
that could be easily, easily folded up. Um, we have folding chairs and we have a Victorian non-folding chair made to look like a folding chair because they were so very common. So um, please come on up and look at these things. <laughs> don't do what I, do what I say, not what I do. And uh, please don't handle them. Thank you. Um, the Hutchinson House is open from May through September. Um, we're open Labor Day to Memorial Day. Is it the other way around? Yes. Memorial Day to Labor Day. Yes. And uh, we are open Saturdays and Sundays from 1 until 4 p.m. We have wonderful, uh, uh, we have wonderful docents. Please do come. Uh, two of the docents, well, three. Now I'm going to now I'm going to get in trouble because I'm not seeing real clearly. All four. Okay, we have several people here who have been docents or who um, are docents, and uh, we're very grateful for all of them. And they do a wonderful job. So do stop in and see the the house. And what are the hours of the historical? Oh yeah. Society? You know, do, do you know? I think it's Twelve to three. <laughs> Wednesday and Friday. I didn't know if they were changing with <coughs> Yes. From eleven to two. When did you get the grant? I'm sorry, what was the question? When did you get the grant for the uh, Carnegie Library? Yeah. I can answer that. It was in nineteen thirteen and the building was completed in nineteen fourteen. Thank you. And we've been in this building since 1994. And the first, the first collection at the Carnegie Library, well, maybe before also, was they got the collection of Danish, a huge collection from the Danes home and from the Women's Christian Temperance Union had a collection of books. And that's <clears throat> kind of what comprised that first, uh, the first collection when they opened up. Uh, it was, it was pretty big here. And in fact, Julia Hutchinson was important not only in county WCTU, uh, but also in the state WCTU. So we have a wonderful banner from the state at the uh, Hutchinson House. Julia Hutchinson was the granddaughter of the people who built the Hutchinson House. Pat, did you have a question? I did. I, do you know when Wapaka became the county seat? Uh, 50, 50. I used to read the newspaper. There was a newspaper from Ogdensburg, and Ogdensburg was vying with Wapaka to be the county seat. And I, I've always wondered, when, I, when did I read that paper? Okay. So it was <laughs> 55, 56, there, there, uh, there was, the election was in 55, 56 that they voted. But for, for the post office, I didn't read this part, but she said that when the post office, when they were getting the name for the post office, a, a busload of people from, men from Wyawega, why am I laughing? A busload of men from Wyawega came to see how the election was going and they were driven out of town. They were just, they were just drunk out of town. <laughs> You go back to your town. We're gonna have it. So, uh, so I, I didn't read that part because I didn't really want to get into violence. 